This is really the fundamental issue, this word freedom, which has so many definitions, the freedom of the ancients and the modern freedom. And in reality, maybe I'm old-fashioned there, but I, I believe that freedom to survive, to endure, must have a content. It must be a freedom for something. Mm -hmm. It's the freedom that you define in your, in, your, in your books. And what we have seen since 1989 is a great vacuum in that respect, including in the countries that were liberated, so to speak, from dictatorship. Uh, it has been, there has been this idea that now all of us as little free individuals, the invisible hand of the market would save us and would give us uh, an answer to all our issues, including the moral issues. Mm -hmm. And that is not the case. And what we have seen is a kind of death of politics in that respect, because politics had been discredited by the isms that destroyed the, 19th, the 20th uh, uh, century. And now, in a way, politics is coming back under different guises. I mean, we see these horrible uh, I mean, uh, extremists of the uh, Islamic uh, State. They are occupying the vacuum of values, uh, as are many movements around the world. And that is what is dangerous. And I think if we want to be, I mean, to get out of the dark ages, to answer your question, we need to have a more positive and clear view of ourselves. Paul says we, have, we don't have enough confidence. I think sometimes we have too much confidence because we don't really think about who we are. And if we are not able to define who we are, then others will do it against us and then we'll be in trouble as we are now. We have to get engaged, all of us, and particularly those of us who share these ideals of humanism and freedom, these things that we hold quite dear to ourselves. They're not going to continue, in my opinion, if we just take them for granted and just assume that things will continue, that people will have some enlightened view, and somehow it'll all work out. It'll only work out if we take active steps to do that. And I think that right now, at this stage in time, um, I'll speak for my own country, uh, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, we have a, a huge responsibility, in my opinion, uh, to use the leadership that we have been uh, granted by many in the world uh, that we have assumed. We have a responsibility to use it wisely and actively and correctly. And uh, if we're going to do that, then uh, we in the U.S. need to have credibility. We've lost a lot of our credibility for, uh, for many reasons in the last uh, decade or two. Uh, we need to regain it. Where is Germany going? Is Germany, will Germany stay if the conflict between the West and Western Europe and the United States is going to be heated up with Russia? Because I have the feeling that Germany is today very uncertain and very uneasy about the present development. Extremely uneasy. And if you would allow me a micro perspective on the German affairs, suddenly a new party popped up in Germany, the alternative for Germany, and got immediately in regional elections in Saxony and Thuringia and Brandenburg, 10%, even more than 10%. And that, part, that party is very much reluctant concerning European integration, especially the Euro. And they are, and that's interesting, they are pro-Russian. And this combination between being critical of European integration, especially the Euro, which brought about German domination in Europe. If, which, if you would be President Obama, what would you do? What I will do, I will try to address the American nation and the world. I will try to play Pope Francis, Urbi et Orbi. And I will say something like that. 
First of all, I will try to create the impression that I am leading not from behind, okay? Secondly, I will try to say to the ordinary Americans in very simple words, folks, you know what? We have reached the tipping points. I would agree with Paul, who was talking about tipping points that might be reached in the future. This was apparently a thought. I would say we are in disaster already because the international order is unraveling, and I'm very glad that Jean-Marie will try to uh, re-energize it. But, you know, shit is coming. And we cannot rely upon the global governance because it doesn't exist. The Security Council is simply blocked by the veto right. And the whole structure, the whole architecture, is the leftover of the Second World War. It's a long time ago. And all principles have been undermined recently. Even the Westphalian state, the Yalta agreements, the Helsinki agreement, and the rest. Nothing does exist. Putin was the first to cross all red lines, which I don't know where. Obama had these red lines, as we know. But our well-being, fellow Americans, and our prosperity depends on whether we as a nation, normative power with hard power, because there is another normative power, the European Union, which had no hard power, so we need to answer the challenge. And my second thought would be, to reintroduce the dimension of the values into the foreign policy, that everybody, especially after Iraq, I'm sorry to say, forgot about values as a kind of, you know, some leprosy or whatever. But I will try to persuade the world who will be listening to this issue of values. When the American president says values, it looks something like regime change, something that we don't like and hate but I would talk about humility. Because everybody understands that America is a, like a dark in a very a small room with glass windows, and every time it wakes the tail, it breaks the windows, okay? Everybody understands it. <laughs> but I would be very humble and would be addressing, you know, Americans and the world. And thirdly, I will try to formulate the idea of returning America to Europe and reviving transatlantic partnership without maybe words, I like the words, by the way, concept of democracies, but maybe not everybody would accept this term. And I would return to the tradition of the Marshall Plan when Americans helped the world. And without Americans, hardly, you know, the countries that were defeated, Germany, Italy, Japan, hardly they would have succeeded. And in order to persuade Americans and the world, which is suspicious of the, of the Americans, and the world does not like Americans, well, <clears throat> for many reasons. And I would try to do something practical. I would present the idea of giving Ukraine the status of the American ally, without waiting for NATO membership. And I would find, and I can find, persuasive arguments for President Putin to agree to put the peacekeeping forces along the border of Ukraine and Russia, consisted of non-aligned nations. Essentially, um, the idea is that difficult things won't happen without America's playing a leadership role. Easy things can happen. We can do certain trade rules. We can solve certain problems that are easy. But when something difficult comes along, American leadership is indispensable. Uh, it doesn't mean that America can do it all by itself. It doesn't mean that America is the policeman. But I think we've gone through a, 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 a pendulum swing over the last, say, 15 years. And we reached this point where America thought, with all respect, Paul, that it could reach across the world 10,000 miles and overthrow a regime. Whether you agree that it was the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do, 
We did it badly. We lost respect both for the decision to do it, but the fact that we did it badly. That it took years and years of slogging on the ground to end up with a time where we now have the Islamic State and we have to go back and figure out what to do. And that's 10 years after the invasion. So whatever you think of the decision to go in, whatever you think of Saddam Hussein, this was not a highly competent operation for which the United States previously had been respected. Afghanistan, Kosovo, uh, World War II, Korean War, whatever you think, America's military power was highly respected. Deterrence was working. The Chinese, the Russians, others <coughs> believed that if America threatened them in the period after Afghanistan, before we invaded Iraq, people were, Iran was rushing to make a deal with us. We lost all that, and that's the terrible tragedy that has made our indispensable nation more difficult to operate. And, and, I, and that's the, the real tragedy of Iraq, is that right or wrong, it's ruined America's self-confidence and other countries' confidence in America, as you mentioned. There was a time when America was able to gather together a group of democracies and uh, deal with uh, a mass murder in Kosovo, overthrow uh, Milosevic, but do it by the Serbian people did it. And we prevented a genocide and we had a post-war plan and we had legitimacy. That's what indispensable nation means. It doesn't mean reaching 10,000 miles and overthrowing regime. On the other hand, and this is where the pendulum problem is, it also doesn't mean pulling out of Iraq without thinking through the consequences putting troops into Afghanistan and pulling them out before you even finish getting them in, trying to lead from behind in Libya, I think Paul Wolfowitz was right. Uh, we didn't need to lead from behind in Libya. We didn't need to create a new theory that America, the leader of NATO, allows Britain and France to take the lead. They did a really good job in using military power to overthrow uh, Gaddafi, but then nothing. You needed a plan. You needed to make a deal with the rebels, that if we'll come in and give you some air power, but you have to be uh, prepared to pull your weapons down if, you, if we succeed. We need to have a peacekeeping force. We need to have a post-war plan. Then America could be the indispensable nation, guide NATO, and Libya wouldn't have been a disaster because the rationale was there. We prevented a terrible atrocity from happening, but we had no plan because we were leading from behind. Britain and France were well-intentioned, but they didn't have the wherewithal. So Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, and then Syria, the great abdication of American responsibility. Whatever you think of, uh, of America as the indispensable nation, all those millions of refugees think we could have made a big difference in those first six months by changing the calculus of the Syrian military, knowing that the United States was going to engage, either through arm and train or selected airstrikes or whatever. We had a mass murder of 200,000 people, and the last time they took notes and wrote down how they tortured these people was in this continent, and it was Germany that did it. It's a horrible thing that's going on by a fascist regime in Damascus, and the world has done nothing, come up with all these reasons. Well, Assad, you know, we might need him in our fight against ISIS. You know, well, we might need him in this case. It could be worse. There could be chaos. It's really hard to imagine anything worse than a leader torturing and murdering and taking notes and photographing hundreds of thousands of his own citizens. And the United States <clears throat> did nothing. So that's the other side of the pendulum. And I would like to think there's something in between. I think there's something in between. And that something in between, however you want to define it, that's the indispensable nation. What we see in the Middle East, the hardening of the position of Saudi Arabia, the hardening of uh, Israel, all that points to a fundamental fact, which is that there is no more the reassurance. I think it's another head of policy planning staff, I think it's Richard Haas, which, who once coined the, sense the phrase, uh, the reluctant sheriff, 
when there is no sheriff, then every country in the world begins to feel it is on its own. Whether it's in Asia, or whether it's in the Middle East, or any other place where there's a crisis. And that's a very dangerous uh, situation, because you see that whether you want to have a, a successful negotiation with Iran, whether you want to have a, a de-escalation in the whole region of the Middle East, you need countries like Iran and Saudi Arabia to come to some accommodation, because it's at the heart of the problems of the region. But it's much harder for them to come to an accommodation if they don't sense that behind, behind them there is an enforcer who will stabilize the thing. And, and that, I think, is something that we see all around the world with a, a sense that the U.S. is there, but you're not sure it's there. And certainly when you go to Riyadh, that's a sense you get very strongly. And I think you get it sometimes in Asia. What separates me from the rest of the panel is uh, I'm the only guy from the East, and uh, I'm the only active uh, government official. So I have to be careful, otherwise... <laughs> 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 but uh, I, I just, uh, I'm just tempted to follow up uh, Jamie's point about uh, the somewhere in between. First, I do hope somebody will be able to find some somewhere in between, because we are still relying on you, and you are, in our mind, still the only superpower in the world, in a sense that, uh, well, from the perspective of military strength, the only superpower, from the perspective about, of the curiosity, getting involved in difficult conflicts, being ready to make uh, difficult concessions and the criticism and follow through to the solution. I th so I do still believe that U.S. is indispensable when it comes to the solution of uh, difficult issues. But it's only that it's no longer sufficient. I think you need the cooperation of other countries. That's it. So there's not the only sheriff. We need a group of sheriffs, which is led by the United States. We are talking about 1.3 billion China, 1.2 billion India, both of which are rising. So it inevitably comes with the tr transition of the balance of power. It seems to me that the war in Ukraine, and this is war, this is not simply incursion of the, you know, of the bear, uh, into Ukrainian territory. This is the war and annexation of the territory of the European state with 45 million people. And the war already affected many lives and not only Ukrainians. Regretfully and sadly, it affected the lives of the people of Netherlands. And in Ukraine, we have not only the expansionist desire of some mediocre guy in the Kremlin. But in Ukraine we have, I don't like you know, this clash of civilization term, and I thought that Huntington was wrong, 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 and now I'm returning back to this term clash of civilizations. In Ukraine, the Russian system, that the system of war, unfortunately, we cannot survive in a different way. We are war civilization. And we, liberal minority, have failed to change the system. So the, our state still can mobilize itself <clears throat> on the basis of war patriotism, mobilization. It's war rhetoric. It's war tactic. And so Russia in Ukraine is fighting you folks, the West. So this is a war of the new type. And what is dangerous about everything, it's the fact that my favorite, favorite political leader of Germany and Brussels, well, by the way, who are people in Brussels? Well, I hope that Brussels does exist. He will be there. <laughs> Good, we have a fresh blood over there. And you know, the West pretends that nothing is happening. This is the most serious and the most dangerous thing. The West never produced the word aggression or war, pretending, you know, that, you know, the life is as usual, business as usual. And so the blurring of the border between war and peace in our time gives stimulus and triggers many wars like that. Because, well, if there is peace and at the same time there is war and nobody acknowledges that there is war and no punishment for crime, you can go forever. But so we, this is the difference, you know, between our time and the previous time, and our time is much more dangerous. Yeah, but because, you know, this country uh, was indeed deeply shocked by uh, what happened on, on July 17. 
Um, but I can uh, assure you that just reading the newspapers, the Ukraine is not part of our public discussion. I mean, what's part of the discussion is what we can do with our tomatoes, and, and that we are not very happy with the sanctions. So it, it, it doesn't live, you know, the, the, of course there are troubles, but there are troubles everywhere, but your troubles are not our troubles. So your idea that, that it's a war against the West, it's not experienced as being a war against the West. Do you think that the West needs more evidence in favor of my argument? <laughs> I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> <laughs> An eternal discussion, as all this, the Greeks is about uh, in, in geopolitics and international affairs, realism versus idealism. Should international affairs, geopolitics be based on defending your own interest, and nothing more than <coughs> that, which probably is now the case, or the idealism that certain basic values are at stake and there is a kind of moral obligation to take action? Um, I Idealism is realism, because ideas are fundamental. Ideas can kill and ideas can do a lot of good. And to ignore the power of ideas is extremely uh, dangerous. And I think it is up to the idealist to integrate their ideas in the game of global politics. But the notion that there are interests that are distinct from ideas, I think every country con constructs you know, its own idea of itself. Uh, it's an imagined community, to quote uh, a mm -hmm. famous uh, author. And if you, if you don't realize that, if you don't realize the power of ideas, you are not a real realist, because you are looking at just a very small set of factors that influence the behavior of countries. So I don't oppose idealism, idealism and Paul, realism. I would like to ask you... Um, the the Iraq war, was that an act out of idealism or realism? <laughs> I, th I think you can't underestimate the extent to which it was seen as a real danger confronting the United States after September 11th and this combination of states that were involved in supporting terrorism and Iraq was, whether it was involved, how much it was involved with Al-Qaeda is is a different issue, but it was clearly a, a state sponsor of terrorism in a rather vicious and dangerous way. And in fact, the group that now calls itself ISIS grew out of the terrorist Zarqawi who was operating in Iraq even before we went in there. I happen to agree with Jamie that an awful lot of mistakes were made when we got there. And the fact is, I think thanks to the we finally got around to having an effective counterinsurgency strategy and therefore we got to a point where things were reasonably stable and I think it was a real mistake and an unnecessary mistake to leave and that's created chaos in its wake. Um, but I would say it was much more about a sense of US national interest. The, the, the question of idealism, if you like, comes in and it comes in in Afghanistan if you've actually gone in and removed a regime, what do you replace it with? And I think the notion that we could have reinstalled some Sunni dictatorship uh, in the wake of what we'd done was not a realistic alternative. So uh, I'd say it's even in that respect, I, I think what Jean-Marie said is absolutely right. Ideals are part of the real world and how people think and how they choose to govern themselves is part of the real world. Whether Iraqis could have risen to that challenge, uh, in some sense, the Kurds, who were almost as badly abused as everyone else, rose to that challenge back in 1991. And I think our, when I said, to some extent in Syria, I think we repeated the mistake of 1991. I don't mean that in 1991 we should have gone to Baghdad. I don't think that was ever a, a good idea to consider. But we allowed some 100,000, maybe 200,000 Shia to be slaughtered by Saddam's army under our, <laughs> when we controlled everything that moved on the ground and could have stopped it. I think you might have had a, a, a sort of southern Iraq that was, would have been a success like northern Iraq. But I just say one other thing. Uh, it's been mentioned that a lot of here is about how countries deal with their past and when the past is as ugly and brutal as it has been in Iraq or as it now is going to be in Syria, uh, 
that's an enormous challenge. South Africa is, among other things, remarkable for Mandela's wisdom in finding a way to bring the old oppressors sort of back into the tent, if you like, but with a form of justice. It was called Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, where people, if they confessed their crimes, were more or less forgiven. Uh, that's one. South Africa is unique. Each country is unique. But I think, as I said in my remarks, it's impossible to exaggerate the damage that has been done by these regimes of fear and terror. And perhaps to some extent that's an aftermath in Ukraine as well. I don't know Ukraine. But, but Jean-Marie is right that Ukraine, a healthy Ukraine is the only, it has to be part of any solution here. But frankly, a healthy Ukraine is what Putin is afraid of. He, d he didn't go into Crimea because Ukraine was failing. He went to Crimea because Ukraine had thrown out a, a man very much like him whom he had helped to install. And I have to disagree with you on one point. You said we've seen the limits of military power. Unfortunately, Putin is now demonstrating the effectiveness of military power, and I think that's what makes him so dangerous. I think, and I might err, might err because I'm not so very close to, let's say, to the policymakers, but that it was the European Union that brought about the conflict in the Ukraine. This kind of association and integrating the Ukraine, the Europeans were marching as if nothing happened. In the 90s, they integrated the former glasses countries of the Soviet Union. Suddenly, the European Union started to brass again. I just want to remind you that in the 80s, it was, it was as if it was a dead end concerning the European integration. People spoke about the rural sclerosis. There was no horizon of expectation anymore in the 80s. And suddenly, 1989, 1990, 1991, there was a European project integrating, modernizing the former Eastern European countries. And the European Union continued with that policy concerning the Ukraine. And that made it suddenly evident that there is a problem concerning the architecture of the European Union. You are modernizing, it's a wonderful, wonderful perspective, a wonderful task, but what about policy? What about security policy? What, what about the consequences and your responsibility concerning Ukraine? So suddenly the Ukraine became, I would put it like that, the question of Europe. And it's a question for Russia to define itself, and it is a question for Europe to define itself. And in so far, it's not a problem of pragmatic policy. It's not a question of this or that conflict moment. It, is, it goes much, much deeper. It's a question of definition and self-definition. And so far, well, it opens again a horizon, <coughs> well, of expectation and, well, of fear. What is going to happen? It's not a conflict that will pass by. It is something which goes very, very deep. And in so far, <coughs> well, the Ukraine might be, might be, well, the lackness teeth of the European, of European integration. And I'm returning to my first intervention, which is for me, well, the question of Germany and its relation to Russia. Yeah. Uh, Lily and I were at a conference about the Conference of Vienna in World War I in 2014. There's a big difference, and it's called nuclear weapons. And we don't talk about it very much. But here in Europe, I suspect it drives a lot of the decision-making about how far they will go in confronting the Russians because they fear what will happen, what will happen with the next step. What if they go into the Baltics? What if we respond militarily? What if they say, if you respond militarily, we will use nuclear weapons? And we hear these conversations from Vladimir Putin dropped selectively to different people designed to scare the very politicians that you're talking about, designed in, with the express purpose of generating fear on their part so that when we decide how much pressure we will place on Putin, Angela Merkel decides 
that we can't violate the 1996 agreement with Russia, in which we agreed not to put uh, bases in Poland or the Baltics. We can't violate that agreement, okay? But that agreement has been thrown out of the water, jumped on and ripped into 17 pieces by the Russians by invading Ukraine. And we're worried about our part of it. And at a minimum, it seems to me, we could signal our determination to defend the Baltics. And you may not be very happy, people, that we made this decision, okay? And maybe it was one of the dumbest things that NATO ever did. But we did it. And our obligation now is to have clarity and make sure that the other side is sure they know what we're going to do. Because if we don't have that level of clarity, we create the possibility of a terrible crisis. They have to know what we will do. They have to know we will defend the Baltics. They, and by placing a base there, we will show them that we will defend them. And then Putin will know that's a line too far. If we don't do that, if we worry about irritating the Russians, then he might misinterpret our willingness to defend the Baltics he might do something, and we might have to defend the Baltics anyway. Wouldn't it be better to draw our line where we mean it, and we've already signed a treaty that says we will go to war for the Baltics? And it seems to me if we won't defend that line, we've got a much, much bigger problem. So what worries me a bit is the, the gap, not in this panel, but in general discussion between the, the rhetoric of uh, universal commitments and the reality of re rather limited commitments. And, and that, that is a very dangerous uh, set of positions that really make things more dangerous. I saw it firsthand in, uh, in Syria when I was working uh, with Kofi Annan on, on Syria where I could see those officers from the Free Syrian Army at the time convinced that NATO was going to come uh, um, save them. And I was telling them this is very unlikely uh, to happen. And so there, with that kind of rhetoric, you raise expectations. Uh, you make any negotiation more difficult because uh, the, the parties believe that they're going to be saved by, from the air. Uh, and when the disappointment comes, well, what happens is one of, the, what was one of those officers was telling me, you know, if you're right, Mr. Gano, someday we'll put a suicide vest. Uh, that's uh, where we are now. So I would caution also for Ukraine. We have to know exactly what we are prepared to do, what we are <coughs> not prepared to do, because that rhetoric is, uh, is dangerous. I'm totally convinced that it's essential to uphold the commitments of the NATO alliance. It's, we have to do our best to stabilize Ukraine, but Ukraine is not a member of NATO, uh, and we must not pretend it is in our rhetoric. Because if we do that uh, at the hour of truth, uh, then things will not happen. And that's even more dangerous, that's, that's then gets really dangerous. Because, uh, and so I think we, we have to tone down a bit, a bit things. Uh, one more question. Are we ready to modernize? Are we ready for the 21st century? One number from the polls, 37% of Russians would like uh, uh, to think that the interests of individuals personality are much higher and important than the interest of the state. So 37%, less than half, but still a lot of people, millions and millions of people of Russians, you know, <coughs> consider that they can live in a rule law, in a, uh, in a law state. The problem is, and it is a dramatic civilizational problem for Russia, and not only for Russia, I'm afraid that for Ukraine, for all other, you know, post-Soviet rabbits, it would be a problem. We lost the dream. I have a dream. We lost a dream. We had a dream by the end of the 80s. The dream was to join Europe. Europe was a kind of, you know, mm, 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 paradise with freedoms, dignity, well-being, etc. all nice things. But now, 
when we look as all retired Western, I'm not sure about American politicians, but European politicians definitely are standing in a queue, uh, knocking at Gazprom a door and offering their service, not only Chancellor Schroeder or Finnish Prime Minister Lipponen, but so many others. You know, I have a list of uh, 40 political leaders and personalities from Europe, members of the uh, uh, Russian companies with very uh, fuzzy uh, biography. So we lost, uh, you know, our dream because we think Europe may be in decay, maybe not, but this is not the ideal that we, are, we should strive for. So if you practice what you preach, it will be the great support for us. 